Leaders and politicians from around the world are calling for action against Beijing's human rights abuses. That says China's practice of organ harvesting from non-consenting donors has been largely ignored for years. A major U.S. film studio is looking toward China's checkbook. Universal Studios' largest resort sees its grand opening in Beijing despite deteriorating U.S.-China relations. China, the U.S. and other nations around the world are facing off over next-gen technology. They are competing for first place in developing 6G telecom networks, and a Chinese tech giant is eyeing the lead. And Beijing is hoping to join a major Pacific trade pact, but not everyone's on board. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Before starting with daily news today, we have a short announcement about our newsletter. If you're interested in a short weekly summary of what's really going on in China and some behind-the-scenes content of what we're up to, make sure you subscribe to our China in Focus newsletter. You can find the link to sign up in the description box down below. Every Friday morning, the latest will land in your inbox. Now we turn to organ harvesting in China. The Chinese regime is known to have been removing organs from non-consenting healthy people for decades, then selling them to international patients seeking transplants. But the crime has been largely ignored for decades. Now at the World Summit on Combating and Preventing Forced Organ Harvesting, politicians and leaders from around the globe are calling for action. NTD's Penny Zhou reports. When I was educated on this issue, and what was happening, it took my core and it shook it. Forced organ harvesting is truly a monstrous practice that is difficult to conceive, even exists, until it is brought before you. The idea that there are those that take someone's life and treat them like parts for pay or favors still leaves me horrified. Dozens of political leaders and experts from 19 countries are gathering virtually to raise awareness of China's continued practice of forced organ harvesting. That's a state-sponsored campaign to kill prisoners of conscience to supply organs for China's transplant market. Organ donation is a precious act of saving a life. But forced organ harvesting is commercialized murder and without doubt amongst the worst of crimes. French Senator André Gatillon explained that some politicians have chosen to be silent because of threats from the Chinese regime. When one questions the forced removal of organs in China, one quickly runs the risk of being labeled heavily anti-communist or anti-Chinese. And sometimes even risk the threat of commercial or political retaliation from Beijing. Hence the appalling diplomacy of silence, which is far from confined to France. China is one of the top destinations for transplant tourism, meaning people from all over the world go to China to get a transplant. That's because Chinese hospitals offer very short wait times. Beijing claims that their organs come from voluntary donors. But a London-based People's Tribunal in 2019 called the regime out for lying. It concluded that the practice of forced organ harvesting was happening on a significant scale in China, with Falun Gong practitioners being the main source of organs. The spiritual practice has been persecuted by the Chinese regime since 1999. Song Kim, a judge from the Seoul Administrative Court in South Korea, argues that global organizations like the United Nations may not be of much help in this case. That's because the Chinese regime itself is a member of the UN Human Rights Council. It might take another 20 years for UN to take effective actions against the crime. She suggested that instead, individual countries use autonomous sanctions under what's called the Global Magnitsky Act. The U.S. has used it to punish Chinese officials responsible for abuses in Xinjiang. That's by freezing their assets and banning perpetrators from entering the United States. Kim says the same approach can be used to target facilitators of forced organ harvesting. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Universal Studios' new resort in Beijing officially opened on Monday amid light rain and tight security. Excited tourists showed up early and ventured into the park. 
The grand opening comes amid deteriorating U.S.-China relations in recent years. The theme park will be the U.S. production company's largest and fifth globally. It's also the first in Beijing. I'm very happy, very excited, hoping that we will have a good time and not queue up too long. The park receives strong support from Beijing since the start of its construction in 2016. Beijing authorities also extended one of the city's main subway lines to reach the site. As the city's first internationally branded theme park, it's expected to become a strong rival to the Disney Resort in Shanghai. Because of the pandemic, all visitors are required to wear a mask and present their health QR code upon entering every shop. The codes function as contact tracers inside China. They display the user's virus test information, as well as whether they've come into contact with suspected cases. According to Reuters, visitor numbers were capped at around 10,000 on Monday, but will increase in the future. Wikipedia is banning seven editors from mainland China, and it revoked access power for 12 others, a first for the organization. Wikipedia released a statement last week saying they are worried about Chinese infiltration of Wikimedia systems. Wikipedia is a volunteer-edited online encyclopedia overseen by the nonprofit foundation Wikimedia. For over a year, the foundation has investigated a group of users from mainland China. They found out that these users exploited their access to some editors' personal information, and some users have been physically harmed as a result. Hong Kong-based media previously reported that some mainland Chinese Wikipedia editors had threatened to report their Hong Kong peers to the city's security police. Some Hong Kong Internet users have worried that their online activities may be monitored and used against them, especially when they edit sensitive articles that track events of how Beijing suppresses Hong Kong's freedom. That's after the Chinese regime forcefully pushed through the so-called national security law in Hong Kong last June. The law punishes any action the CCP deems threatening to its regime, including voicing criticism against it. In a letter to its volunteer editor's community, Wikimedia Foundation's vice president Maggie Dennis revealed that the mainland Chinese group has also been trying to control the narrative by editing articles to favor certain viewpoints. She told BBC News that they are trying to promote the aims of China. Hong Kong Free Press reported an edit war often breaks out when the Chinese editors push to label Chinese state-run media or pro-Beijing outlets as reliable sources, while labeling outlets critical of the regime as unreliable, while Hong Kong editors oppose such approaches. A former World Bank CEO is alleged to have pressured staff to boost China's ranking. Kristalina Georgieva is now heading the International Monetary Fund. An independent report says when she headed the World Bank, she pressured staff to boost China's ranking in a flagship report. This was at the same time the Washington-based lender saw China's support for a big capital increase. The report was prepared at the request of the bank's ethics committee. It uncovered that the Doing Business 2018 report should have ranked China 85th, but instead ranked it 78th. The report's ranking is based on world business conditions. Georgieva says she disagrees fundamentally with the findings and interpretations of the report. As a result, the World Bank said Thursday it would pull the Doing Business report. The Chinese regime said on Friday it attaches great importance to improving the business environment. China is the third largest shareholder of the World Bank, after the United States and Japan. The U.S. and China are locked in fierce competition for an edge on next-generation technologies, including 6G. And it seems China could already be one step ahead in that race. And Didi's Juliet Song has more on that. Chinese tech giant Huawei is reportedly vowing to lead the world in 6G technology. Even though it won't be commercially available until 2030, countries are already racing for the top spot. Both the U.S. and Japan are spending big dollars on 6G development, while Beijing has set 6G as one of its key research areas. But why is 6G so important? It's said to be at least 10 times faster than 5G. And it can power fully self-driving vehicles and virtual reality, even in remote areas. Japanese news outlet Niki Asia says the CEO of Huawei shared his 6G ambition with staff members in August, saying, our research into 6G is preparation against a rainy day, and we aim to seize the ground of 6G patents. 
and it appears Huawei is already on the move to seize that ground. In a survey looking at about 20,000 6G patent applications, over 40 percent of them come from China, followed by the U.S. and Japan. And many of these Chinese patents come from Huawei. Countries that are able to secure more patents will have more of a say in setting industry standards, and patents could bring in good money as well. Huawei holds the highest number of 5G patents in the world. Reports emerged earlier this year that Huawei will start charging companies royalty fees for using its patented 5G technology, including Apple. Huawei CEO Ren Zhengfei also touched on the impact of U.S. sanctions. The Trump administration cut off Huawei's access to advanced chips and almost crippled the company's smartphone business. In the first half of this year, the company saw its biggest ever revenue plunge. But Ren isn't giving up. He says the company will try to develop advanced chips on its own and keep hiring top talent, including from the U.S. and Europe. Juliet Song, NTD News. Beijing is trying to join a major Pacific trade pact. The U.S. spearheaded the pact under Obama to counter China's influence, but later left the deal under Trump, who said it kills jobs. NTD's Juliet Song has the details. Beijing is applying to join a major trade bloc that spans the Asia-Pacific region. The bloc is called CPTPP, and it's a big deal. Member countries of this bloc create over 10 percent of the world's income. And what are the perks? Better access to other countries' markets. The trade pact cuts or reduces 95 percent of import tariffs between member states except in sensitive domestic industries, like Japan's rice farming. And who are the members? Eleven countries in the Asia-Pacific region, including Australia, Japan, Canada and New Zealand. But the U.S. is not part of the club. Actually, former President Obama negotiated the deal to counter China's growing influence in the region. But later Trump put the U.S. out, and Biden also won't rejoin. He said earlier parts of the deal would need to be renegotiated if the U.S. rejoins. China's application to join the club came soon after the big news of last week, the U.S., U.K. and Australia forming a new alliance to counter Beijing's clot. It's unclear if Beijing's application will be approved. To join, it needs to get consent from all member countries. But several have strained relations with Beijing, like Australia. China also has territorial disputes with Japan and Vietnam. And there is one area that China can't comply with. It's how businesses manage personal data. CPTPP, you know, one of the rules is that, uh, you know, we really shouldn't allow, we, we shouldn't force companies to store their information within specific countries. Well, China has a, a national security law that specifically says that. And so, you know, how do you uh, square that circle? Um, I don't, I don't think China can. Japan is chairing the trade bloc this year. It says it will thoroughly assess whether China meets the bar to join the trade bloc. Juliet Son, NTD News. And a member of the trade bloc is already opposing Beijing's application. Australia says it won't let Beijing join the club until the Chinese regime does two things. One, remove tariffs on Australian goods, and two, resume minister-to-minister -minister dialogue between the two countries. China-Australia tensions have skyrocketed in recent years. In 2020, Beijing slapped 200 percent tariffs on Australian wine. At the time, China was one of the biggest markets for Australian wine exports. The move followed Australian calls for an investigation into the origin of the CCP virus. The two countries halted dialogue on the minister level amid the standoff. Australia has since filed a complaint to the World Trade Organization regarding China's tariffs. And Taiwan is also casting doubt on Beijing's bid to join the trade bloc. Posting on Twitter, Taiwan's foreign minister says, quote, China wants to join the high standard CPTPP. Is this a joke? The tweet comes after China announced a ban on Taiwan's wax apple and sugar apple imports without warning. Beijing says it found pests on these imported fruits. The move could be a blow for Taiwan's agriculture industry. Last year, up to 97 percent of these fruits exports went to China. Taiwan says the move is an act of weaponizing trade. Taiwan says Beijing hasn't provided any evidence for its claim of pest concerns. Taiwan is considering filing a complaint to the World Trade Organization over the fruit ban. 
Beijing's fruit ban isn't entirely a surprise, though. Earlier this year, under heightened tensions between mainland China and Taiwan, Beijing banned Taiwan's pineapple imports, citing harmful creatures that could come with the fruit. Taiwan fired back by saying there's nothing wrong with the pineapples and accused Beijing of playing politics. France cancels a meeting between its armed forces minister and her British counterpart. The move comes soon after the country recalled its ambassadors from the U.S. and Australia. The action all stems from a pact to counter the Chinese communist regime. Here's NTD's Eddie Atkin with more. French Armed Forces Minister Florence Parley has postponed a meeting with the UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace this week. France was left fuming after the UK, the US and Australia agreed a new pact called AUKUS, and Australia cancelled a £27 billion submarine contract with the country. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says France has nothing to worry about from the deal as he arrives in New York for the United Nations General Assembly. I think that the AUKUS deal that we've done with uh, our Australian friends and our American friends is uh, it's, it's not, you know, exclusionary or adversarial uh, towards anybody, uh, whether any partner, friend or partner around the world. The Prime Minister says the UK and France stand shoulder to shoulder in many important ways. People don't realise this, but there is one country uh, with which we already have a, a nuclear agreement to, to share nuclear testing, and that is actually France. France recalled its ambassadors to the US and Australia on Saturday. President Macron will speak with President Biden in the coming days. The former French ambassador to the US tells Sky News that selling submarines to Australia was more than just a business deal. Providing 12 submarines to Australia was for us a strategic choice. Uh, we wanted to build a strategic partnership uh, which would be uh, the pillar of our Indo-Pacific strategy. He says France did not know the US and Australia had been planning the deal for months. He denounced what he suggested was a backroom deal that betrayed France. But former U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta hails the deal. He says the most important thing that needs to be done in dealing with China is to strengthen alliances. I think what that does is it sends a message to China that uh, we are not going to simply sit back and allow China to have its way in the Pacific. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison says Australia raised the issue about the submarines with France months ago. He says the capability of the submarines ordered from France was not enough to protect Australia's sovereign interests. Morrison says he is disappointed France recalled its ambassador, but says he understands and respects the decision. The UK and the US will help Australia develop at least eight nuclear-powered submarines. This pact is widely regarded as an effort to counter China's influence in the Indo-Pacific. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. Hong Kong's next leader will soon be decided. About 5,000 Hong Kongers began voting on Sunday, mostly from pro-establishment circles. Their ballots will decide which candidates are chosen for an election committee. That committee will then select the city's next leader. Hong Kong held its first ever political race since Beijing changed its electoral system to ensure only patriots governed the city. Five polling stations across Hong Kong were heavily guarded by police, while pro-democracy candidates were nearly absent from the ballot. Sunday's polls saw less than 5,000 people cast ballots, mostly from pro-establishment circles, to vote for candidates in the election committee. That's a 1,500-strong body that picks Hong Kong's next leader, the chief executive, next March and fields 40 of its own as lawmakers in the 90-seat legislature. The electoral overhaul announced by Beijing and passed in Hong Kong in May significantly reduces democratic representation in institutions and introduces a new vetting mechanism for candidates and winners. The makeup of the electoral college itself has also changed scrapping memberships for community-level district councillors dominated by Democrats, while adding more than 500 seats for pro-China businesses, political and grassroots groups. Hong Kong's current leader, Carrie Lam, said on Sunday that the city's electoral framework was now improved. Changes to Hong Kong's political system is the latest in a string of moves that have placed the international financial hub on an authoritarian path including the national security law that punishes anything Beijing deems as subversion, secession, terrorism or collusion with foreign forces. Most prominent pro-democracy activists and politicians are now in jail or have fled. 
Hong Kong police arrested on Monday three members of a pro-democracy student group. The students are aged 18 to 20. They were accused of a conspiracy to incite subversion, including by helping deliver snacks to prisoners. Police said they incited hatred of the government and had urged others not to obey the law. The group is known as student politicism. They had set up street booths to elaborate on their opinions about Beijing's policies and call people to gather for protests. The group said on its Facebook page that two of its leaders, Wang Yijian and Chen Zhishen, were among the three arrested. Police raided the group's warehouse and seized large quantities of sweets, surgical masks, biscuits, lotion and books as evidence. All of these items are on a list of goods prisoners are allowed to receive from outside. Hong Kong police have arrested more than 100 people under a national security law that Beijing imposed on the former British colony in June last year. Critics say the law erodes the freedoms promised to Hong Kong when it returned to Chinese rule two decades ago. Beijing claims the law is necessary to safeguard Hong Kong's prosperity. The national security law punishes what Beijing considers subversion, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces, with up to life in prison. Many of the city's most prominent pro-democracy politicians and activists are in jail, either under the new legislation or after being convicted on other charges. Meanwhile, many pro-democracy groups in Hong Kong have announced their dissolution. On Sunday, Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions announced that it would start the dissolution process. In the past few months, the Hong Kong trade union has been constantly attacked by pro-government media. In the past few weeks, some of our members have received more information. That led us to feel that if we continue to operate the trade union, our members may face personal safety risks. Hong Kong non-government organization Wallfare was recently forced to announce its dissolution after months of operating. The NGO has been focusing on the imprisoned pro-democracy activists' plight. In the past, we have taken every step carefully. Every step we go, we remind ourselves that we are doing humanitarian support, but today we cannot go on. 61 human rights organizations consigned an appeal on Thursday, urging Hong Kong to drop charges against pro-democracy activists and organizers of a vigil commemorating the victims of the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre in China. The appeal also urges targeted sanctions, including travel bans and asset freezes, on Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam and other top officials. The co-founder and president of Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi reportedly plans to step down. That's according to Reuters sources. The Chinese regime has been heavily scrutinizing the firm since its New York listing earlier this year. Sources say Jin Liu told some associates that she expects the government to eventually take control of Didi and the management staff. One source said she told executives close to her she plans to leave, and she encouraged them to start looking for new jobs, too. Didi says Reuters' rumors about management changes are untrue. Officials have launched a broad crackdown on private companies, including those in the tech sector, to control big data and break down monopolistic practices. U.S. Customs seized a shipment of fake sports memorabilia that would have been worth a small fortune on the collector's market. The haul included fake championship rings from the New York Yankees, Chicago Bulls and Philadelphia Eagles. A total of 86 fake rings were found. That would be worth nearly $2.4 million if they were real. Customs and Border Patrol authorities are warning sports fans against scams and to avoid paying huge prices for counterfeit memorabilia. The shipment came from China and was bound for Florissant, Missouri, a northern suburb of St. Louis. 22 of the fake rings were for some of the Cardinals' World Series titles. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.